are we starting? Yes. Sure, cool, let's start. Introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm a guy. Hi, guy. Hello, I'll introduce yourself. Hi. My name is Josh Greeley. I'm a voice actor for Funimation Entertainment, no longer a subsidiary of the Navarre Corporation. Uh, ADV Films, Seraphim Digital, Monster Island uh, Studios, Amusement Park Media, Ocatron 5000, and 48 Windows. Yes, yes, yes. That is true, that's very true. One more than 47. Yes. Uh, <laughs> done a lot of voice work over the past seven years, including anime and video games, and very, very happy to be here. Uh, hi, my, the, the gentleman next. hi, my name is Crispin Freeman. No, I'm sorry, my name is Christopher Ayers. Um, voice actor, ADR director, and now ADR writer. Woo! Uh, yeah, I write for um, ooh, ADV Film, Seraphim, Digital Media, Amusement Park Media, Overtron 5000, Funimation Entertainment, New Gen Pictures, uh, with some video game work for Square Enix. So, yeah, and I'm also the holder of the City Cup of Doom. Uh, a lot of theater work, uh, regional, national tours, Broadway, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so that's me, I'm just a short jerk with a big cup. Yeah. I'm Daniel Moore and I'm really out of my league. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm a webcomic artist, uh, as I'm sure most of you know because you were here for opening ceremonies. Um, uh, I've done a lot of theater work throughout the years. Uh, Mostly local stuff, but yeah. nothing wrong with that. Work is work. Oh yeah, oh, work yeah. is work. We're Absolutely. Yeah. So this is uh, tales of theatrical horror, which could turn into also tales of con horror, <laughs> tales of booth horror, <laughs> tales of horror in general. Um, wow, jeez. <laughs> I know it's a very live table. Isn't yeah. It? Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not. It's not. The um, so, uh, let's start. Stage horror story. I think the guy who's been directing theater his entire life on stage is <laughs> Oh gosh, I've got so many weird things. How old is everyone here? How old are you? 17? 15. Okay, then I can't tell the, I can't tell that story. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I did. I did this show that was based on the play Laurent, and uh, yeah. I've never heard that story. I'll have to say because it involves a voice actress, oh. um, a very well-known, established voice actress, and something really awkward that happened. Um, nice. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell the story that I usually I didn't get to tell in mock combat. Uh, this did not happen to me. Except a good friend of mine, um, and this is a true tale of theater horror. I have a friend who was the uh, understudy for Robin Hood in a production. Oh, yeah, these things are like really, really, really we're going. Mm. Okay, here we go. That's better. Okay, so um, I have a friend who was the understudy for Robin Hood in a production of Robin Hood at Cosmediana in Fort Worth, and he never, never got to go on. He never got to go on stage because the guy who played Robin Hood was an absolute trooper. He'd gone on sick. He'd gone everything until midway through the run. My friend Dan replaced him for the rest of the run. Uh, there's a fight scene between Robin and the Sheriff of Nottingham towards the end of the show. And uh, they had, had used long swords. And for theater, when you use a weapon, it's been dulled down for safety, but it is still steel. It is still metal. And it was supposed to go, if, if what he told me, if memory serves, he was supposed to block, block, swing back, into an overhead cut with a scream. Ah! Well, this guy blocked and mulleted down into the attack and stepped forward into it. Well, the other guy had hit and swung all the way around, so the blade is going full, full tilt. With a long sword, it's very, very hard to stop. The blade went through here and out the other side, uh, effectively pulling a joker. Um, <gasps> The doctors said the only thing that kept his teeth from shattering, because a blade like that, that heavy would have shattered his teeth, was that no, was that he had been staged to attack with a scream. So his mouth was wide open, and that's why it did as little damage as it did. And so they, they you know, this is a student matinee too. <laughs> yeah. Warp some kids for life. Um, that was so real. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know. And uh, so they got they got the ambulance. They got him off stage. 
they turned to my friend Dan and said, okay, you're on. We're starting from the beginning of the fight scene. <laughs> he had just seen a good friend of his injured for life, a career ruined, and they go, you're on. Yeah. We're starting with that thing that ruined your friend's career. Yeah. It's kind of a horror story. Yeah. Something yeah. else, something else. Well, we had one where, uh, come on in. The, uh, yeah, sit down, we demanded. Now, get over sit here. Hurry. Yes. No. Tifa. And apparently you're not supposed to sit on the outside. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, don't sit on the outside. We'll make fun of you. Yeah. And then he does it. <laughs> <laughs> come on in, come on in. We don't buy art. Uh, just all. Yeah. Not unless you ask for it. Not unless you ask for it. That's good. <laughs> okay. So we had one where uh, Dude, we're nice. in the middle of doing uh, Big River. Oh, good show. Yeah, fun, very fun show. Um, and the tech crew had built these docks that the uh, stairs could come out and come back in. Oh, and nice. they'd been moving them in and out like that. They'd run on, do it, and run off. Well, they decided, you know, it would be so much easier if they lay behind the dock and pushed them out and then pulled them back in and didn't move. Now, that's great, except for they failed to let the actors know this, who jumped off the back of the dock. Oh, a God. guy who was six foot two landed on a girl who was five foot two, oh, square on her back. Ooh. Yeah. God. Uh, so she got, she was rushed to the hospital. Yeah, obviously. Luckily, no, she did not break her back. Yeah. And, uh, she was able to come back and do some light stuff for the final performance a couple weeks later. Who did you play? Uh, I played Mark Twain and the Doctor. Oh, uh, nice. Oh, nice. I had a blast. Fun stuff. Oh, yeah. The um, Doctor. No, when we did, when we did it, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> horrible, horrible um, incident happened also. Our girl played Mary, Mary Jane. Uh, is Mary Jane the one who sings if you think it's lonesome? Who's that character? Oh, uh... I, it, it's not Mary Jane. But it's, it's you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. A young doing. ingenue that yeah. sings to her dead father. She sings this song called If You Think It's Alone Somewhere You Are Tonight, Then You Ought to Be Here With Me. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Um, the actress who played the role about 20 minutes before Kurt got a phone call from her mother that her father had died. And oh. it was like that sudden. And she was yeah, completely in hysterics, and I just I said, Go. Go now. I won't get inside. She didn't have an understanding. I'm like, no, I'll get somebody to cover you. I'll get them good. She got them and made it back in time for Act Two to come on. She's like, no. She said, people would have wanted me to be here. And she, I will tell you, her standing on stage singing that song to the coffin was probably one of the most singularly brave things I've ever seen an actor do. One of, one of the most courageous things I've ever seen. Because I couldn't have done it. I could not have done it. It's probably an amazing performance. It, it was. It was, yeah. So, yeah. When you said Big River, I hadn't even thought about that. Ooh, that's another horror story. Come on, Josh. I don't have a lot of horror stories. My stage stuff always went very well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, of course we had a lot of... Uh, geez. Anything goes had a, had a moment happen. <laughs> Of course, there's always moments with anything goes, because anything goes. Yeah. Uh, I can't, the guy who played, what's the character's name in the bank wall? Moonface. Moonface, thank you. The guy we had playing, yeah, the guy we had playing Moonface was brilliant. One of the, the sweetest old men ever, but like perfectly fit for role, like in terms of looks, everything. Uh, and there's, there's a scene, I'm trying to remember what scene it was. Uh, it's a scene. It's a scene uh, on the boat where everybody's out on the deck. The whole show is on the boat. Oh, I know. On the deck. <laughs> okay. The scene on the deck where uh, he's outed as being in face movie. Okay. okay. And I played uh, me and my little brother amongst a myriad of little singing parts were almost all of the sailors on the boat. As and so I had to play the guy with the sailors. Sailor. Yeah, yeah. By the Greeley brother. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and the two Chinese guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I had to be the one who run down on stage and is supposed to capture him. Uh, well, and he's supposed to, you know, uh, uh, either he doesn't run away or anything, but I'm just supposed to run on stage again. Well, I missed my cue. And I, I don't know, I can't even remember what was going on. Like, I think I had an issue going on with my wardrobe and I was trying to get it secure. And all of a sudden, there's just silence on stage. And then I realized, oh wait, they just outed him. And I bolt. Like, I, I, I'm only supposed to just come out on stage with Jordan and, you know, 
grab right. him and yeah. take him off stage. Instead, I come on stage full burst, full running. And the look on the actor's face. <laughs> just as, charging like yeah, a rhino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As this rhino of an actor just comes charging out from nowhere. It was just, it was, oh, and like the last, I, I, I don't want to, he literally just says, oh. <laughs> and, and, and sorry, he's not supposed to move. He starts running the other way. <laughs> To which everyone on stage who was, I mean, it's, thank God there's supposed to be a curtain, the curtain call right then, because yeah. everybody on stage is trying not to laugh. And the only thing you hear as this is going on is, well, our theater was incredibly small. And as he's running off stage, I'm running after him, the curtain drops, the lights go out. I'm still at full run when the lights go out. <laughs> so all you hear after lights go out is, boom, 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 and just hear this big old crash as I get everything that was backstage. <laughs> Okay, that made me think of another one. Right. It's Josh's favorite story that I tell. Yes! And it didn't happen to me. I just, I, I've toured for so much, I've, I, I'm friends with so many stagehands. You hear these theatrical horror legends. Yes. <laughs> this is a triple story. Yes. Oh, First one involves a production of Jesus Christ Superstar. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. It's a great show, wonderful. The director for this outdoor theater, had decided that he wanted, during the song Superstar, which is at the very end of the show, he wanted 200 doves released from the stage to fly up <laughs> and then swoop down over the dancers and then out over the audience. Really, really effective. So they bring in, the opening night, they bring in bird wranglers with their 200 doves. And he said, you know what I want? I want them on the stage and I want the box to open them to fly up and then swoop down over the dancers and, and out of the audience. And the bird handlers go, that didn't happen. <laughs> because when you release birds, they fly this way. They don't go. The birds don't go. <laughs> that, that happens in movies with CGI. They said, what we can do to get this swoop effect? And she said, I've got to have a swoop. I've got to have a swoop. Because you know how directors get. <clears throat> and I can say that because I am a director. <laughs> you, have to, you have to release the birds from high. And they will fall and then catch themselves, so you get kind of a swooping motion. So they, they're like, okay, so we need to rig the drop box high. So the 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 the, the IATSE crew, the union crew. <laughs> uh, nothing wrong with IATSE, I've got a lot of good friends around. They bolt the drop box to, to the grid, and you know, with birds they they do now Superstar is a long show. And the number of Jesus Christ Superstar happens at the end of the show. So we've gone through almost two hours. The songs hits, the cue hits, they hit the button on the drop box, and they drop 200 cooked white doves. <laughs> they rig the drop box above the lights. <laughs> and the heat from the lights goes straight up. That's an allergen. <laughs> yeah, what they say? Like, and that's a horrible story. Yeah, but it's... I tell you that only so that I can tell you these two. <laughs> Passion play. In somewhere like Novo, Utah. Oh. They decide that um, the director, again, directors with concepts. And I'm a big concept director, so you got to look out for us. Okay. He wanted the actor playing Jesus on the cross. And he wanted the Roman guard to throw the spear and have it stick in his side and then blood and everything. And so they hire a guy from Hollywood to come out and rig a bleeding spear gap. Well, the problem is with the, the prop, when it was standing there, like all, all the tech guys back there going, uh huh. The problem is with the prop, it would slowly, during the course of the scene, start slipping into the hilt <laughs> of the spear and bleeding. So they had to rig it with a safety <clears throat> that could be released and then it could be shoved in. And, and would, you know, retract the end of the blood. So, opening night, nervous actor forgets to release the safety. Oh. The actor on the cross, it, you know, into your heads, I commend my spirit, and the head drops. The first words out of the actor's mouth were, oh my God, I've been stabbed. <laughs> Get me the F down. <laughs> Screaming in absolute agony. <laughs> now, I tell that story so I can tell this story. <laughs> These stories just build on yeah. themselves. I, I, I thought it was, Jesus Christ, I'm in stack! Give me a second! Hold on to your hat. Another production. 
brush in like septic Montana. Um, <laughs> okay, laugh in septic Montana and not know Hope, Utah. Okay, okay. Anyway, I just, I don't know what city it was. My friend Moose told me this. Production of the Passion. Big concept. They want the actor playing Jesus to ride in on a donkey. But like most theater companies, they are too cheap to afford to get a donkey in for rehearsals. They bring the donkey in opening night. Big outdoor theater, big passion play. Actor gets on the donkey, and he starts riding it off the stage. The audience goes, ooh, because it's a live animal. The donkey freaks. <laughs> and bolts. <laughs> With the actor playing Jesus on the back. It heads right towards the brick proscenium and stops. <laughs> a donkey can stop. An actor on a donkey. However, physics don't work like that. Bam! Face first into, into a brick proscenium. Down he goes. Not to Not to knock. They take him off to the hospital. They have an understudy. Understudy's gonna finish out the show. <laughs> Something fails on the rigging for the cross, and he falls and breaks his ankle. That's cursed. So, they get one of the apostles to do the ascension scene. Now, they do, this is his favorite part. They do not get flying by boy or someone to rig him to float up. Instead, they just use a block and tackle system. Oh. oh, hang on, it gets better. <laughs> so you hear that, you go, oh, God. They tell you, okay, look, you don't have to worry. All you have to do is you come out on stage, and the apostles go, ooh, and you quiet them down, and you look up and raise your hands. And we will we'll call it to you, and you'll be pulled up, and you'll raise up. Now, you have to keep your hands up because there's a baton in the way, so that you, can, you have to have your hands up to move it out of the way as you're going up. And then once you get up there, you can put your feet on the baton, otherwise they hang below the teasers. So again, that's what you can now understand why they couldn't afford afford foy. Yeah. So actor comes out, apostles go, ooh, he goes. Nothing happens. <laughs> stage manager obviously has been under a lot of stress. Two actors have been injured. So apostles start to improvise. Ooh, doubt, doubt, doubt. Actor does the right thing. He lowers his hands, quiets them again. Nothing happens. <laughs> so, apostles, again improvising. More doubt, more doubt, more doubt. As he lowers his hands, <laughs> the stage manager realizes she's missed the cue. Go, go! They yank as hard as they can. <laughs> And he takes off like a rocket <laughs> as the lights are going out. In the blackout, you hear <laughs> the next scene of the movie, oh, he's alive, he lives. And there are these two limp feet hanging all over the street. <laughs> that is morbid right there. That is really a twisted, sick story. <laughs> Yeah. You'll never look at the passion play where Jesus Christ oh. are the same after hearing those stories. I love it. Oh. The, the story, guys. The anything goes one reminds me, we, we, it's not as bad as those, but we, we can never, never top those. No, no but uh, why do you tell that now instead of the end? Because yeah. <laughs> I would have forgotten, it just popped into my head. Oh. No, I have ones you can tell that that'll, that'll top it. Oh, oh okay. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah. So it might be that for the end. Yes. I love it. Anything goes is one of the first productions I, I did. Nice. And I was playing the drum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and there's the scene where Moonface Mooney is still pretending to be the priest. There's always and been Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and he's trying to get everybody to do uh, to confess their sins to him in this big out to everybody kind of way. And he starts doing it like an auction at one point. And the drunk gets up and he yells, you know, I'll make it three. And then according to the script, he passes out. Well, this is fine, but the director decides to put tables out in the audience, which is a concrete floor. <laughs> and this is during rehearsals, and they, they, they're doing this, and I'm doing the I'll make it three and fall over. So we do, you know, okay, who'll make it one, two, three? Well, I'll make it three. All right, well, let's stop and let's go back and then start from here. Okay, get back up, sit back down. I'll do it again. One, I'll make it three. 
Okay, let's back up, back it up to here. Now we did this 10 times. <laughs> I'm hitting concrete every single yep. time I go down. Finally, the director goes, let's take it from after Dan's fall. And all she hears from the floor is, thank you. <laughs> that's actually how, how I blew my knee out. I was doing Godspell. I did a six month run of Godspell. And we were in tech rehearsals, and because I was one of two dancers and two guys in the show that could dance, or two people in the show, me and my, my partner in our show, I was doing power spins, which is a tap move that I'm not going to do right now because I don't want to blow my knee up, where your, your one beat is coming down with this and the other foot is coming around doing double hits. Oh, sure. Okay? That's a lot of action on this. Well, when I dance in rehearsal, I dance full out. When I fight in rehearsal, I fight full out. Because I believe you perform it like you rehearse it. And that's, that is just the way I'm trained. So we were, and there was a light cue that was happening during this section. And so I'm going for They're like, okay, stop, let's do it again. Uh, stop, let's do it again. We did about nine or ten times, and all of a sudden, on the 11th or 12th, everyone in the theater heard it. And I went down screaming profanity at the top of my lungs. That's, a, that's actually how I blew this up was was just repetitive. just repetitive, repetitive motion. Had I just, and the thing was, that show, I showed up the next night for rehearsal in my knee brace, but that show I had jumps from my knees to my feet, knee slides across the stage, knee spins, Russian splits, uh, everything that is so hard on your knees, and it killed me, but I got through the show, so. But, but yeah, so I've, I've got a bad knee for because of that. Bad what oh, about more people? Yeah, we're going to go. We come to the horror stories panel. I think I see some of my fighters coming in. <laughs> you missed, don't miss the fight story. Oh. There was a good fight That's story. That's a good fight. That was a horrible fight story. The guy got mauled. Got two. Got mauled. Oh, ruined for life. Yeah. Um, was, you had one too where you had a mouth. That thing happened with, uh, it was like a, a rogue piece of uh, wiring. Oh, no, that, 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 not that happened to me in uh, San Antonio. I did a national tour at the Broadway company, Peter Pan. And we were supposed to, the law was one of the Lost Boys. I was the assistant fight director, uh, Slight and Soil, the bully of the Lost Boys, and the understudy for John Darling. We're in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and we were staged to reach down and pick up these big rocks to build the house for wind. The second act is far too long because we sing, sing the stinking song for wind. <laughs> and just take make sack to last forever. Um, anyway, so we, I was uh, choreographed to go up, grab, pick up. Well, there were these big flowers and stuff sticking out, and one of them, because they were all held in place by floral wire, one of them had a piece of floral wire sticking out. It's very thin, you can't see. Well, I came up and came straight down on it. I got one inch of floral wire in my cheek, straight up, and because I hit it and stood straight back up, the doctor said most people's instinct is to turn away. Had I turned away, I'd have ripped a one-inch gash in my cheek. Um, but it's a puncture wound. Yeah. And it's a facial wound. Yeah. Okay, facial wounds, any guy who has shaved himself and cut himself knows. Facial wounds bleed. Yes. <laughs> puncture wounds really bleed. So I am gushing blood <laughs> in most of Act 2. It was, it was, it was not pretty. It was just yeah. not pretty. No, but that, that show also, we had a serious injury. Uh, I did not become the uh, co-fight director for the show until midway through the run. Oh. The choreographer for the show and the director decided, oh, we don't need a fight director for the show. The, the actors can set their own fights. Now, there was another guy in the show named Jim Alexander who unfortunately uh, passed away a year and a half ago. Uh, really good guy. Uh, Jim was also a fight director. In fact, he and I hit it off immediately because his background was in stage combat, improvisation, mime, and tumbling. So, he and I had almost the same background. Oh, and Shakespeare. And, uh, so we had it off like, like Long Lost Brothers. <clears throat> we kept watching what was going on. And we would, on a weekly basis together, go to stage management, go to company management, and say, somebody's going to get hurt. What's going on is not safe. Someone's going to get hurt. And we, every week, we would file a complaint with management. So that when somebody was hurt, people could not point a finger at us. <laughs> because, for example, they had Kathy Rigby, who was the star playing Peter Pan, Flying, here's her dagger, like this. Oh. Oh. On a flying by Floyd Wire, which the Floyd guys are very good, but it's still not an exact science. We complained about that, we complained about things within the fight, we complained about all kinds of stuff. It wasn't until midway through our run, about 
six months before we went to New York for the first time. The Kathy was a half inch off of her mark, which flew her into a set piece, which jammed her sword right here. Oh. Oh, 12 stitches. Oh. Right like that. Had it been, had her dagger been angled at all, she would have put her eye out. Um, the day after that, she finished the show. I mean, she, she, wiped, she at one point grabbed Wendy's gown and just wiped the blood all over the front of the, the girl's costume. Huh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> real, real, real pretty. Oh, wow. um, That's a whole new visual to that movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, she was bleeding like stuck big because again, it was a wound to the face. Yeah. Um, so the next day they called Jim and I in the studio. Uh, I just got a call at my hotel and said, you need to get to the, the uh, theater right now. John, John wants me, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so Jim and I got there, and they said, okay, you guys have been complaining. How long do you two need to reset the lights? And since Jim was a swing and could actually sit out almost every performance and watch, he was the fight director, I was the assistant, um, or as he said, the associate, because I did as much creating as he did. Um, and we said we need a month to reset every fight in the show. We'll start with uh, the Captain Lincoln Peter Pan, and it was nice. Jim and I took three days to create the, the sword fight between Hook and Pan because I was one of the Lost Boys. So I was the same size as Kathy Rigby. He was about the same size as the actor who played Hook. So we worked out the entire fight. We set the entire fight. Then we called both actors in. I worked with Mo, who played Captain Hook. He worked with Cap. I fought Kathy's role. He fought Mo's role. And then once we were secure that they knew the fight, we finally pulled it together. And then we went through and we set up a fight for the shows. And after that, we didn't have any injuries, so. <laughs> so Jim and I just kept looking at magic. Uh, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't the Peter Pan also the one where y'all had the smoke, the smoke machine incident? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> he remembers all this. Another Ayatsi story. He's my, he's my best friend. He's known me for a long time. He's heard all these stories a hundred times. We're all messed up. Yeah, yeah, we're messed up. He's my bestie. That's crazy. Like right. <laughs> anyway. No, uh, it was uh, Second City. We'd gone from Boston to Atlanta. Again, it was another Alice story. Brand new, I, I, no, no offense. <laughs> brand new, brand new, uh, new hire. Brand new, just joined the union in Atlanta. And they told him to fog the stage. We had a chemical fog. So, he walked out, plugged it in, and he hit the button, a little bit of the uh, liquid came out. And being new, he said, oh, I guess when the lights hit it, it turns to fog. So he sprayed the deck down, and he sprayed the rock units down with chemical fog, which is oil-based. <laughs> so I love everybody who does tech is going, oh, God. <laughs> so the thing is, the show starts with nobody on stage. The lights come up, and it's never light. And the music had a music cue, the Never Bear, which was the understudy for Michael Darling, would poke his head out and would come dancing out and pick flowers and then the Lost Boys try to catch him. So, we're all waiting backstage. Music, all of a sudden we hear the audience go, oh, which means the little koala bears stuck his head out. And we're like that. And then all of a sudden the audience starts laughing. <laughs> Looking at each other, because we're all sitting, we can't see anything that's happening on there. So, music you come from, we're supposed to poke our heads out and lean back. We poke our heads out, and this kid who was not known for, he was always doing weird stuff, was laying on the floor like he was swimming. <laughs> <laughs> and we all poke our heads back. <laughs> so, music goes on, we all lean out. By now, he is crawling to the flowers. <laughs> Yeah, this was a child that you never knew what he was going to do. <laughs> so we just wrote it off to, okay, he's being himself. <laughs> and I yell, catch it. Janet yells, grab it. And we converge on the stage. <laughs> Three of them from the rock unit. <laughs> two of us from the side unit. And it is Lost Boys on Ice. <laughs> <laughs> Neverberry is not even doing the, the, the stick, he's just crawling off the stick <laughs> with his bouquet of flowers. <laughs> I like the man, um, So 
we cannot figure out what's going on, and finally it hits us. There is fog juice all over the <laughs> Well, we've got maybe eight lines of dialogue, and the pirates are coming. <laughs> now, our smallest pirate was 5'10". <laughs> but that was our small. They went up to six, seven. <laughs> but all of them, to make us look even smaller, were in heels about that high, <laughs> with hats with these huge feathers. So you had eight and nine foot pirates. They were just these huge monsters. It was really cool. <laughs> so every single one of us, we're all wearing costumes made of ultra suede and fur. All of us know that for the most part, these pirates, their whole opening is on the rock unit which is slick. All of us immediately screw the blocking, we throw ourselves onto the rock unit and start wallowing around trying to get as much of this oil-based fog juice into the fabric as possible. Well, we had to leave. We got off stage. Pirates had made it through their number with a minor, a couple of minor slips. We come back on for four lines of dialogue before the Indians come on, and that is a huge jazz number. <laughs> oh, jazz when we oh, step yeah. off stage, they hand all of us, all of the extra um, remnants from the costumes, all of the fur pieces, all the ultra suede we can hold. And that second scene became about the Lost Boys cleaning Neverland. <laughs> we knew that we just had to get the deck as clear as we could. We got it so mopped up, there was only one person who fell over the entire thing. But it was, yeah, it was Lost Boys on ice. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> Told me the story was that as you guys came off stage and they were handing you the extra cloth, the yeah. director says, says, The tech guy has been fired. Yes. Get out there and clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys been fired. Get out there and clean up the stage. Okay. We, we had one that was almost a disaster. We were, we were doing uh, the Fantastics. Oh, uh, that show. Yeah, um, I was playing Henry and actually my wife was playing Mortimer. Ah, nice. And nice. at one point in the show, if you haven't seen it, we take the main romantic male lead, and there's a part where it's supposed to look like we set him on fire. Yeah. Now, with that, my wife and I also have done a fire comedy act. Uh. So we know how to use fire, and we explain this to the director. And they're like, oh, great, and we can do it safely. We know this. What it is is that we we're just going to use flash paper, so there's this right. burst. I scared the hell out of the guy the first time I did it behind him. But, Anyway, I've got a, a finger trigger with. Okay. If you've ever seen it, it's got a little fireball. Yeah, it's got yeah. a little bucket and a little yeah. spark. Yeah. Now I use it when I do Dan Yankees. Yeah, we were using a full sheet of the fire paper okay. in order to get a big, big blast behind it. Now, normally this went without incident. Yeah. Except for once when I hit that circle, it lit the paper, but at the same time shot it out of the cup. Chance right onto his back. <laughs> <laughs> now her and I are sitting up behind him going, oh crap, as it just goes, whoosh. <laughs> his hair didn't light on fire, we're good. <laughs> Backstage, we looked at each other and we're like, we're not telling him that happened. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, and incidentally, then you appreciate this, the last time we did Damn Yankees was a, a fire effect that, that we did that was so cool. When uh, Applegate, the devil, makes his appearance, I always add the word hell, though. Because um, so we've got him in the, in the old black suit with the red tie and the you know, really sharp looking red socks, red handkerchief. And, uh, oh, he's got some great instrument with black shirt, red. Uh, no, 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 no. We had the flash pot set up in front of where he appeared. I was using an old uh, standard magician's uh, drop back appearance. He was an archway that had a black thing that was weighted, so he was holding it. And as we triggered the flash, pit, the flash pot, he would just pull and drop his hands to the side, and the it was weighted here, so it just pulled up. So he just appeared out of nowhere. Well, it took us a while to get the right uh, weight. We had to use several sheets of a uh, of flash paper. We loaded the flash pot and set this ball, uh, this wadded ball. I think we used five sheets to get it to get it right. Okay. Literally, so we took five sheets of uh, flash paper and just wadded them and set them on top of the flash pot. Okay. On top of the trigger. The reason we had to say we went through trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. What would happen? It was so cool. The flash pot would go off, and as this thing was going this way to make him appear, 
this ball of fire would come up and dissolve right at his face. So it looked like fire, gentlemen. It was really, really a cool effect. So, yeah, you said fire. And it was really fire. Yeah. We, uh, I got a couple. I think I'm fine. Like uh, another one. And this isn't necessarily. Well, I guess you could kind of consider it horror. It's it's the fact that this was pulled off and every single performance was brilliant. It was other anything goes story. A uh, really good friend of mine, uh, known her my entire life, her name is uh, Chandra Robertson. She was a big help for the local Clifton Theater that, that I did almost all of my theater growing up at. And when she was, she played. Oh God, okay. Which one had was it the was it the male lead whose mother was on the cruise with him, or was it the female lead whose mother was on the cruise? I think it was the female. Female. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She yeah. plays the female's mother. Okay. And there's a scene. Just before, uh, it's it's still in Act One, if I remember correctly. There's a scene where they're talking at night. It's the mother talking to the daughter about don't go see that man. He's right. young trouble, whatever. And they're in their quarters, and she's in kind of like a night. Well, the very next scene after after she goes off stage to go back to her room, the very next scene after maybe two lines of dialogue from the daughter is. The next day, where the mother is on deck in right. a full outfit, it's like a full white dress with a corset and a big old hat and an umbrella. And there's maybe two lines of dialogue between the time that she steps off stage and she's supposed to come back on stage in a completely different costume. Every single night, what we had done is the way that our theater was set up was you had the stage and uh, side stage, and all the makeup, everything, all the prop department, the makeup rooms, and the dressing rooms were down a little flight of stairs, and in the back lined up with a little hallway that connected both sides. Okay. So just before that scene, we laid out every single piece of her costume on the floor Smart in that dresser. hallway. Smart dresser. And she would, look like, it, it was the funniest thing to be on the side of the stage, because she would, you don't see that, boy. She goes off stage, and before she's even out of sight, it's just, boom, clothes coming off. <laughs> It's like it looks ridiculous, and she would literally within I think we got it down to 10 seconds. She would be out of that thing and putting on the other thing, yeah. uh, uh, every last piece. And as she's about to, as she steps out on the stage, someone hand her the umbrella and she would go and just walk off stage and start doing her lines within 10 seconds. Yeah, she was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Uh, in, that, in that same scene, yeah, it was the funniest thing to be backstage when ours did it because what it was is they had. About five people with this hoop with uh -huh. a sheet on it. Uh -huh. Two people inside the hoop. Uh -huh. She would step off, take off to a run to that hoop. The, suddenly the hoop would come up. Uh -huh. yeah. There's a bunch of flurry, the hoop would drop, and she'd be in the different Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did uh, the musical Chaplin, talking about quick changes. And the show was a quick change nightmare. And I had so many and such fast costume changes. They got us, um, they got me. Two of the dresses for National Total Lacage Hall because the costume changes for the Cajels are so fast. And they had this amazing system. They had a whole series of phrases that were all different shows. Uh, if I came back and, and they were working and I was putting on ties and stuff, and they would say, Equus, I need one foot to come up like a horse because they were changing my shoes. <laughs> they would say, Superstar, I knew both arms had to go straight out like this. And they had a whole series of shows. Show names, and they go da da, and I'm I'm literally changing positions, uh, <laughs> and they, I never missed a costume change. I never missed a single costume change, and I have no idea how we how we pulled it off because they were <laughs> they were geniuses. But yeah, costume changes. Are, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were doing it's a four person show, and the fourth person doesn't come in except for the last fifteen minutes of about a two and a half three hour long play, and everything else is just three guys. It's called the brothers. Uh, I played the middle. Uh, what it, basically, if you haven't seen it, what it's about is about three brothers. They're, uh, the oldest one is kind of a cranky drunk. He's in his 50s. The middle one is in his late 30s, early 40s, and he's just kind of the, the mediator of the group. And the other one is the very youngest one. He's still in his 20s, and he's just an idiot. Uh, they are forced. They hate each other. They've grown up hating each other their entire lives. But when their father, who was insanely rich and wealthy dies in order for them to inherit the uh, the uh, their part of the inheritance he said you have to for the next 20 years after my death 
have to spend an entire summer, every summer with each other out in my own log cabin. So, and they, they, the stipulation is you have to arrive there by this time on this day, and you cannot leave until this time on this day. If you break those, if you break any of those, any of those years, you forfeit your ability. All three of you forfeit the ability wow. to get the inheritance. And they absolutely hate each other. And it's a slapstick comedy that's absolutely brilliant and beautiful. So, and it takes place inside this cabin. The entirety of it takes place in the cabin. Well, near the end of Act One, there's a scene where. Uh, we are getting insanely drunk. Well, at least the older brother is and the younger brother is. And I'm being the mediator and trying to keep some semblance of sanity, not for them, but for me. Uh, and trying to hide the fact that the eldest one's dog has been killed out on this, and we've been keeping him in the cooler where the beer is. And well, <laughs> and well like a fun show. Yeah, yeah, the young one is drunk out of his mind and finds the dog and says, oh, what are you doing in the cooler? You need to go and you need to hang with him. And, he, and the, the older one who's already passed out, he hands it to him and he's sitting there snuggling this dead high school dog <laughs> and I'm just freaking out. Well, the end of the scene is supposed to be that I'm like, okay, whatever, he's out, the dog's there, I don't care, and I'm trying, and uh, I'm running back and forth constantly across the stage. And uh, because he's pulled the dog out, a whole bunch of water and ice has supposed to supposedly had spilled, and I'm supposed to go off stage, grab rags, and come back. Well, at, at the same time, the little brother has broken the door off the hinges and is holding one of the pieces of plywood that, that was the hinge. And the way that we had choreographed it was that I was supposed to come out, start wiping it up, stand back up, he's behind me, and I say, I say his name, turn around, and then he turns around to respond to me saying his name, and he hits me up with the thing, and I go down. That didn't happen. <laughs> Instead, I'm off stage grabbing the blanket, uh, grabbing the, uh, grabbing the towel, and as I'm, as I'm coming back on stage, he has stepped back a little too far, and is covering the, at the entrance onto the stage with the plywood. I'm trying to untangle the towels, and I'm not seeing this. To which all I do is come up and boom! And, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, almost at a sprint. The only thing the audience sees is the lower half of my body fly upwards onto the stage, and me land on my back, pass out. <laughs> to which, to improvise, yeah, <laughs> because we're supposed to thank God the end of the scene comes is supposed to come after that. He's trying not to laugh because he just knocked my ass out. <laughs> he goes, oh, you need another drink. <laughs> Blackout. And uh, grabs, grabs this entire thing. It was, it was alcohol. <laughs> and starts pouring it on my face. <laughs> wow. To which he then just goes wow. and passes out and that's when the scene ends. <laughs> it worked. Wow. It worked. It covered brilliantly. <laughs> it worked brilliantly. <laughs> Oh crap! We had we had one. It wasn't it wasn't stage. It was uh, luckily it wasn't stage in this particular part. We were doing a, a, a pilot for a possible sci-fi show, cool. and um, <laughs> we this director, as they put it, was had this amazing put it, I like that. yeah amazing talent to walk out onto the street, look at some. Uh, you know, decent looking woman or you know, gorgeous woman and say, I'm a director, I'm doing, I'm doing this show, you want to come up here and do something for it. Of course, you'd think the woman would go, right. Especially well, that happens to me. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially downtown Minneapolis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're not talking to LA or something like that. We're talking to Minnesota. But he had this, and he brought this woman in, and it's like, okay, she was going to play a, a tough uh, uh, woman and everything, and I had to do this thing where I was hitting on her, and licked her shoulder, and then she was going to do this. Yeah, she wasn't an actress, and she didn't know how to do stunts and stuff like that. However, she was a bodybuilder. <laughs> <laughs> this is not voting. <laughs> so, she went back just slightly too fast. Yeah. So I didn't get far enough back, and there was just this... <laughs> <laughs> I kind of kept, and I just... <laughs> oh, there's, a, there's a great story about that with Travis Willingham, uh, the voice actor who plays Roy Mustang. He's in Secondhand Lions, the movie oh. with uh, Duvall and... Oh, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Have any of you seen Secondhand Lions? Okay, that, and Travis is in the scene where he's one of the guys that uh, Robert Duvall kicks their butt in the bar. Mm -hmm. Well, Robert Duvall 
just assumed that these were all stuntmen. <laughs> who could take a punch. So he's doing this scene with Travis, and Travis is the first one punched dead in the face. <laughs> and Robert Duvall punches him. <laughs> and he's like, oh, God. But you, you're not going to say anything because it's Robert Duvall. Uh -huh. Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> Bam! him again. Three or four takes, and the director's like, whoa, whoa, Robert, are you really hitting him? Yes, yeah, it's stunning. And they can take He's like, no, these are actors. He had been beating the crap out of these actors. <laughs> Including Roy Mustang. But nobody was going to say anything because it's Robert, it's Robert Duvall. 